bring body and spirit in alignment within the church? And what do we do to start the discussion of taboo topics such as sex and, sex and homosexuality? Did not our hearts burn within us? We want to thank Dean Kinney for the gift of his presence, for the power of the message that he brought to us today. We're going to begin with some questions that we collected. I'm going to invite the CLI board members to come and present some of the questions. Then we're going to invite three people to each mic, three at a time, so we can manage um, the line. All right? So. Dean Kenny, first question is, how do we bring body and spirit in alignment within the church? And what do we do to start the discussion of taboo topics such as sex and, sex and homosexuality? Um, yeah. Um, one of the things that you do to start the discussion is exactly what we did this morning. Take the risk of, let's say, looking at at what's going on. Another way you start the discussion is to look at what's going on in your world. What's going on with our children? What's going on? Can, can, you, can I just be real for y'all to give an example? I got, I got um, folk in my own family and I have some young women, college students, who I always give them space. Talk to me. Tell me what. And they're saying to me, Listen, Papa, it's young women, we don't want to be with men. I said, what are you talking about? No, 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 not that we don't desire men, but she said, if we're men, we know we're going to be talked about. We're going to be on space, Facebook. You can't even have a relationship with a man without being viewed as a conquest. They're blowing my mind. They said, I'm tired. You can't have a relationship with a man without it being all over the place. I just want, hmm? yeah, huh? and anything we share, it's, on, it's everywhere. And I'm tired of that because I don't want to be seen as somebody's conquest. And so we, you know, because we were having this talking about it. I was asking them why so many, you know, I see so many young girls and high school and stuff, and they were just very, very honest with me. He said, at the point you get tired of it, and you just want to get out the game. Wow. It made me stop and just think that we need to do better, some better teaching. Here's something I get, got me. Sometimes, have I raised my sons to be the men I don't want my daughters messing with? And that's a question that I got to face. What have I taught my sons? And I'm not talking about just when the ladies, but, but what do we do when we go out and have our days where, you know, where, hey amen, don't y'all think I'm, I'm going to go to hell, y'all. But me and my son, sometimes we go to a sports grill, sit down and eat chicken wings and chat and talk. What's the character of the discussion when there's nobody there to hold us accountable? Preachers, never mind. No, seriously. Do we really, 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 really help have some real meaningful dialogue and discussion in the church? And here's the whole issue. Our discussions in the church should never be to judge or to fix somebody, but to help us wrestle with what it means to be faithful in times like these. And I'm going to get in real trouble, uh, but I'm also very transparent. Um, when someone joins the church, I don't ask them how they sleep. That's not one of my... Oh, now, if you want to be a part of the church, tell me. You confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and believe in him in your heart. Do you have a, they go in there. 
That's never a question. Not in my, not in my pre-baptismal classes or new members classes. That's not in the curriculum. So why? We, sometimes we just will not deal with the honest things that are right before us. Never mind. I don't want to go into detail. But in any way, what I'm saying is you take moments like this. And all I'm saying is that sometimes you got to develop curriculum. You got to be willing to say, okay, we're going to talk about this. A few years ago in the little, the little church I, I passed there, huh? I had a large group of teenagers, and I've discovered, you know, now I've got a whole lot of young babies, and my teenagers all gone off to college, and, and I've also learned something else about my young adults. You cannot judge their spirituality based upon how often they're in church. And I've learned to make sure I include them and, well, you know, make, you know, and make sure I may, may keep in their lives. But guess what? Do you know what? We did a workshop in a country, rural black church, on get a peace or give a peace and you'll have no peace. And that's how we introduced it. And you know how I introduced it? That God wants you whole. Oh, I, don't, I don't want to spend all my time on this, but let me show you something. Let me show you something. But most of the ways that we construct relationships, it's not mutual value of the Bible says, and the two shall be one. And see, I'm going to be far beyond marriage to talk about that. That's any relationship that I have. You understand? It's someone I consider a dear friend. Do I treat them like they are valuable? Come on, look, look. The Bible says, and the two shall be one. And they said, and then they tell you in Ephesians, this is a spiritual principle, right? One plus one equals one. In the world mind, one plus one equals what? Two. Therefore, to correct the equation in the world, what must you do? Make the parties either one half or fraction or make somebody a zero. Come on, y'all. And we have historically constructed relationship on the church, in the church by fractionalizing somebody or making somebody a zero. Can I say this? In fact, a good woman is a good zero. And the person who's supposed to model zeroness for every other woman is the pastor's wife. Because if you ask her who she is, she can't even tell you who she is. She'll tell you who she's married to. Oh, go, come on, work with me. Now, but I want to show you something. Can y'all handle it? I don't want to profane the temple. Holy Spirit, cover whatever I'm, what I'm saying here. Look, 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 look. So it should be a whole. Well, we'll say, no, she's one half and I'm one half. That means you got a broken person with a broken person trying to have a whole relationship. And whenever you add broken plus broken, you get broken. Well, no, we're not going to do that. She's going to know her place. You think you're a doctor, but in this relationship, you are subject to me. You understand that, don't you? <laughs> That's why you're never going to have one. No, no, come on, come on. Look, look. She's zero. I'm somebody. And the way she gets to be with this somebody, she's got to know how to be a nobody. And anytime she tries to act like somebody, it's my job to, as a man to correct her by force if necessary. No, come, come. Now, can y'all handle this? The woman is reduced to a whole. And if all you want is a whole, as a man, all you are is a pole. And then your relationship is not what God desires. You have a whole to pole relationship. And anytime you live whole to pole, that's ho-ish. When you live whole to whole, that's holy. Did y'all hear what I said? How do we honor whole to whole? Why are we teaching this to young people in the church? 
See, anybody who wants a piece of you, piece of you wants you broken. That's why God does not want a piece of you. That's why God wants all of you. Because if God accepts a piece of you, he's accepting you broken. And God does not want a fraction. And anybody who will be satisfied with a piece of you doesn't want you. They want the piece they're getting. And if you want to find out how much they want to be with you, stop giving them the piece they're getting. And see how long. Amen. <laughs> In an era of increasing Islamophobia and hostility toward Muslims in the U.S., what is or should be the response of the church? Yeah. Thank you. I'm very clear about this, you all. One of the greatest tragedies on the face of the earth, that some of the most cruel things that ever done, been done in human history and some of the most mean folk to other folk are religious folk. And we use religion as a justification for doing it. See, go back to what we talked about, that I recognize you before I call and identify your religion. I encounter your presence and your person where you have intrinsic worth and value. And if you're a Muslim, come on, if you are pursuing the way of peace, life, come on, restoration, we're partners. And I want to tell you why I believe as I believe. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, don't I have to convert them? I don't have to convert them by beating them. I convert them by just communicating my love for them. Come on, come on. Let, 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 let me go. See, I know we got a lot of things going on with Boko Haram and, and you got ISIS, you got Al Qaeda. And there are some mean, evil folk. I mean, it's the only way to call it. And they're using religion for an agenda. And religion is propaganda. Now, but the bottom line is they don't have the market on using religion that way. This nation, it was used, Christianity was used that way to justify slavery. Come on, amen. This is not new. Like people, you talk to some of the elders and they say there's so much terrorism in the world. They said, no, no, I've been living in terror with terrorism all my life. Well, like, like what, what you, how are you going to handle the terrorists, huh? The, what, what you mean? Uh, how am I going to handle you? Now, I, I, was, I heard a, a, an African-American woman the other day. We were in, in like a conference on, on this. And she said, you know to me? I wear my, you know, I wear, uh, you know, I wear my, my uh, you know, her. She, uh, they said, uh, oh, 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 oh. And it was a, but it was a Sikh. It wasn't, oh, no, that was, it was, I thought it was a Sikh. They did it. it was a Sikh. And he wore, we had his, you know, hey, they wear a turban. That's not Islamic. That's, come on. Hmm? And so they came to, oh, are you a Muslim? And he said, why are you asking me? He said, oh, you had that on. He said, well, then I need to ask you, are you a member of the Ku Klux Klan? Because you got that on. <laughs> oh, no, come on. All of these judgments we start making about people. Guess what, y'all? I'm a Christian. I preach Jesus. But the Jesus I preach will not allow me to trample on somebody else because they don't go to my church. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, does that mean we give up on our evangelism? No, but we need to radically rethink about how we evangelize because my argument would be the best way to evangelize is to shut your mouth and be somebody before you start saying something. Come on. Amen. I want to speak life to them. Uh, yeah, you ever notice? Y'all ever know, y'all, see, when I was growing up, you got another question. Oh, no, 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 let me, let me, let me go ahead. I, I'm getting ready to do something. Go ahead, ask your question. So we have a Twitter question. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile race, religion, and politics in the church? Uh, with great difficulty and prayerfully. <laughs> First of all, you cannot separate your faith from politics. Because politics affects justice and the conditions of existence in which we live in this world. Everything you do has a political dimension. So, so if you got faith and you living in this, you, your faith is connected with your politics. And there's certain things I can't be a part of. Now, no offense, and I don't want to, uh, and I don't want to get the church in trouble. There are some people who are running for election that my faith will not allow me to affirm. And
And what I'm saying is, and if you're careful, the people my faith will not affirm are the people who are hollering the loudest about the Christian religion. That religion can be used to affirm that, but my faith, I can't affirm that. Because you're asking me to behave in a way that does not honor the God I love and know. And there's a real problem in here because we have linked a religious position with political righteousness. Come on. So you got to have this kind of doctrine. And if you got this kind of doctrine, you got to have this kind of vote. And there are people now who are voting and using religion as an excuse for justifying injustice. And so you can't separate them. All of us in here, everybody who's being a part of this, you have to raise the question, how does my walk with God inform my politics? And whether I like it or not, there are political implications. See, I don't live in denial about some of the cruel things going on in this world. But I cannot allow what I recognize to determine how I live my life. You understand? There's some stuff out there. You got to be careful. Amen. Just like I know, guess what? I have a real problem with police brutality. But I know all policemen are not evil. And I thank God for a police force that does their job properly. Because I got a son who just is a policeman. And I sit down and we have these conversations. Amen. On the other hand, I've, I'm in close proximity with former policemen and they will talk about some of their practices. And the explicit and implicit bias in their behavior. And they know it. Amen. My sons have never been arrested. But every one of them, I keep reminding them how to act. Why do I have to do that? There you go. Is he like, you take something like Trayvon Martin. I have a very different thing. People will say like, uh, I remember on TV, you got to understand y'all, y'all young people came will be wearing hoodies. Guess what you just told me? That if I wear a hoodie, it's legitimate for you to kill me. What kind of sense does that make? And the only way that I can survive in these United States of America is wear what you tell me to wear. Because the minute that I wear something you don't like, I'm subject to all kind of injustices or not equal protection under the law because I had a hoodie on. Oh, no, I, th I think that's the wrong message to them. No, oh, no, we all say, no, no, what? Yeah, that's right. You have value even when you're a hoodie, and we're going to make sure that we have a country where if you got a hoodie on or you got locks, it doesn't mean you get stopped every time you go around the corner. <laughs> oh, there. Uh, well, you know what? You, if you're really going to make it, you need to cut, shave that off your head. Is that what I want to? And then folk, other folk, well, they'll debate me. And, well, see, we're a real, I'm a realist. But I'm talking about a deeper principle that we're teaching people to really be to say is that justice is not equal. It's only available to those who conform to uniforms, who conform. That's not what I want to teach people. Uh, 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 now, yeah, we through. You got another question? Yeah, yeah, we're going we're gonna to bring this. We're going to bring this to a close. I know there are a whole lot of questions. No, a whole lot of question. We could spend spend all day, and y'all get me get me fired up. <laughs> and the other thing is, the spirit begins to move. Let me let me just thank God again for all the gift of this day. And let me thank Alfred Street, your pastor, and your ministry team for the invitation. But let me thank you for giving yourself to this moment. Because without you giving yourself, there is no moment. And I just thank you for, because you want to know something? You, uh, you draw stuff out of me that would, would not normally be released because 
of the environment that is created for engagement. Let me show you again. Let me show you. I've been dealing with a couple. And everything's wonderful. But they went through a period. There's a, I, I was dealing with a young woman who had gone through divorce. Hmm? She'd gone through divorce. And she came to me crying, saying, Reverend Kay, I need your help. I said, what? And she brought a young man in. She said, Reverend Kay, you know me and Jojo <laughs> been dating. I said, yeah, yeah, I know. You know, I know. She said, Reverend Kay, last night he asked me to marry him. And I can't. I said, why can't? She said, Reverend Kenny, Reverend Kay, I'm, I'm divorced. You know, I've been married. And Grandmama told me that I'm a, if I marry him and he's never been married, I make, and my husband's still alive, I commit adultery and I make him commit adultery. And I, I love him too much to do that to him. Help him understand that I can't marry him, not because I wouldn't like to, but I love him enough. I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to have him living in sin because of me. Hmm? And I said, I began to find saying, now wait a minute, help me understand, help me understand. She said, I'm, I was married, you know it, it was a garden where you were right there. I said, wait, wait, wait. All right, and why can't you get divorced? Well, because the Bible says. And I said, wait a minute. If you're going to interpret divorce based upon the Bible, then let's interpret marriage. You've defined marriage based upon a state definition. And then you're responding to the state with a biblical answer. You're mixing state and Bible. Let's do Bible and Bible. In the Bible. And I said, now what is you been married? Yes, I had a husband. I said, a husband. Let's look. Now the Bible says a husband is somebody who loves you as much as he loves his own body and is willing to die for you as that's what a husband is. And I went through all the places I could find that described a husband. And I said, have you ever had a husband? And she said, well, if, if you put it that way, I've never had a husband. Look, look, look. And then, she, then, then, if that be the case, your sin is not adultery. Your sin is fornication. You've been living for years. You lived for years with a man that was not your husband. Why don't you ask for forgiveness? Come on. And then I turned to the young man and I said to him, now y'all, I don't want to sound crazy, but Jojo, this is not a used woman. Based upon her story, she's never been loved. And I would suggest to you that you found the gift of God. Marry her and love her for the very first time. Because she is in fact still virgin. Come here. And let me show you something. We had a conversation later and guess what she talked about? Her experience with her husband and she said pastor I understand because there is something in the center of me that has been set free to express itself like it never was before thank you
Look, look, listen. And all I'm saying is sometimes, how do you create the loving environment where what is crushed down in people can say, I can let it go now. I'm at Alfred Street. <sighs> and if there was a concluding word, it would just simply be fall in love with Jesus all over again. Discover the real beauty of your presence and your person. And God has not brought you here to fix a mess. He's brought you here so that you would recognize the imprisoned splendor in you. And today, you would hug the miracle that you are. God bless you. Thank you to Dean Kinney. Thank you for being the vessel that the Lord used today. And now, as we prepare to leave, I am simply going to say with a thankful heart, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.